Welcome to our video series called Industry Viewpoints, brought to you by the American Bankruptcy Institute. I am Bill Rochelle, ABI's Editor-at-Large. Each segment will feature an expert providing views on the current state of a particular industry with a focus on what lies ahead. My guest on this edition is Robert M. Lawless, the Max Rowe Professor of Law at the University of Illinois College of Law. That is where the professor himself went to both undergraduate school and law school. And then, after finishing law school, the professor clerked on the estimable Seventh Circuit. We are coming to you today from ABI's annual spring meeting in Washington, D.C., where Professor Lawless is on a panel dealing with student loans. Even if you're not in the bankruptcy community, you know from reading the newspapers that the overwhelming burden of student loans is one of the country's biggest problems today. And that's what we're going to be talking with Professor Lawless about over the next few minutes. And indeed, Professor, I mean, hardly a day goes by that student loans uh, isn't on the front page of the newspaper. Now, that hasn't always been the case. Uh, how, how come it's such a big deal right now? Well, first, thank you for inviting me to do You're this. You're welcome. But that's a great question. Is it, it has been a relatively recent phenomenon. So before 2004, at one point I always like to make the Federal Reserve didn't even track the amount of student loan debt. Really? As you know, right? Every month, the, we get very detailed statistics. From I the thought they, I thought they calculated everything. Consumer, credit cards, car loans, mortgage, all that's out there for consumer loans, but not student loans. Before 2004, there weren't they weren't big enough to be really uh, tracked separately, right? So the Federal Reserve it was just folded into the other numbers, and so I think with Houston, I always like to point that out. That sh tells you right, this is a relatively recent phenomenon. And if you look since 2004, the, those other types of consumer loans, if you adjust for inflation, you adjust for population growth, they've been relatively flat. Consumer or student loans are now about two and a half times what they were in 2004. Again, after whoa, whoa, adjusting whoa, 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 for inflation. Whoa, 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 say that again. Student, student loans, loans are, are two and a half times what they were in 2004, even after adjusting for inflation and population, population growth. Now, where does that rank in terms of other forms of, of uh, consumer debt, like home mortgages, credit cards, and things of that sort? Well, they're behind home mortgages, because right, homes are, the, are they're expensive, right? So, but, but other than that, student loans are the biggest amount of consumer debt that's out there. There's really? More, more student loans than, more than credit cards. Credit cards? More than car loans. Cars? Think about your average car, or if you think about what car loans cost. Now, cars I mean, cost a car is going to cost thirty to $50,000. At but, more student loan debt outstanding than car loans, credit cards, other types of consumer debt. Largest amount of consumer debt there is other than home mortgages. And what about default rates? Higher. And so right now, uh, because of the pandemic, the, as many people will know, student loans went into forbearance. Uh, and through an accounting trick, well, not a, a trick, the federal government just said, we're just going to say they're not delinquent anymore. So. Delinquency rates. Now, what, what actually, during the COVID forbearance, what did forbearance mean? Was interest accruing, but no, not interest being paid, was not or what? Interest was not accruing. Uh, didn't have to pay. Right? No collection efforts. Uh, so it was a true forbearance. Okay. Now, what if you were in default on a student loan before COVID, and now you got a forbearance? What's going to happen when we come out of the forbearance? Well, just a few days ago, the Biden administration announced that everybody will be considered to be current and not in default when the forbearance is over, which right now won't happen until the end of August. But uh, that doesn't mean that the loans can't go back into delinquency. It's just that when the forbearance goes away, everybody will be treated as being current on their oh, student loan. Okay, so let me, let me see if this is right. If you were in default before COVID, once the forbearance is over, you're no longer in default, is that right? That's correct. Now, uh, will that default, uh, let me 
ask another question. Assuming someone begins paying again, will the old default ever come in to no, be it's a gone. new default again? It's gone. It's gone. Okay. Yeah. So you. So as long as you start paying well, again sort of, in the future, it's it's, yeah. it's sort of like uh, uh, going to mass and having your sins absolved. It's wiped away. Actually, that's a good analogy because if you <laughs> sinned in the past, you're probably going to sin again. Right? And if you're delinquent in the past, you probably are going to become uh. delinquent again. But it, it does, in all seriousness, it does give someone, uh, you know, it, the pandemic, the forbearance has been now, will, will have lasted for more than two years, assuming it's not extended again yeah, at the end right. of August. And that's a long time. People's lives may have changed. It, it, it is a second chance for some yeah. people. Okay, now let's further assume that the forbearance ends but somebody doesn't pay a loan, when will it go back into default? Well, usually after 90 days on a student loan. Uh -huh. Well, you know, so technically it's in default the day you miss a payment. Uh, so it, it, it sounds to me like uh, it's year end, really. Uh, at, at You're earliest. assuming there's not going to be another as, That's right, at the earliest. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, at the earliest. That's at the probably earliest. right, yeah. Uh, well, uh, tell me about, about student loans. Uh, is the occurrence of, of uh, delinquencies and defaults, shall we say, uniform across the spectrum of borrowers and, and uh, educational institutions, or are there differences in the kinds of loans that are more likely to be in default? I think that's a fantastic question, because I think one of the things mistakes people make is they think of the student loan problem and think of it monolithically, and it's not. So we know, for example, that uh, black uh, borrowers are more likely to be in default on their student loans. Hispanic borrowers are more likely to be in default on their student loans. People who did not complete their college degree are more likely to be in default on their student loans. People who went to a for-profit college are more likely to be oh, in default really? on their student loans. Yes. Oh, really? Why do you suppose that is? Well, I think um, Next. student for-profit colleges might well, University of Illinois is not a for-profit college. We are a state assume. university, and, 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 and okay. uh, you know we ha have to uh, make our budget, right? Uh, yeah. The state of Illinois is funding less and less of the University of Illinois. I think the latest figure was nine percent of the budget really? that came from the state appropriation. Uh, and this is true. Uh, Illinois the is not the unique football, in that way. The football basketball programs probably generate as much money as the, well, it, as as, the state as, does. As is true in most. Uh, uh, universities that is completely carved off financially so it's a, it's oh. a standalone entity the athletic oh. department is yeah. but uh, when we're, we're not alone in that story that yeah. states have been cutting back but but back to, back to mm -hmm. the, the for-profits uh, so that's a distinctive problem area is I, I think so I think everyone who works in this policy space sees that as, a, as, a, as an issue why and, is it well, they have. Why can't there, private have, profit making industries deliver a product that actually serves its students? Well, I think you know what they their defense would be that they they take chances on more chances on students. I'm not sure that that's that's true. Um, I, th I think there's a lot, historically there's been a lot of evidence that the for-profit colleges market more aggressively. Uh, than uh, the nonprofits and the state universities, and at the end of the day, they have a for they have a profit mission. Right? They have yeah. owners and equity that they're responsible to to produce a return. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, although someone is in default on student loans, at least from what I think I see, the services are not terribly aggressive in, shall we say, uh, suing people and things of that sort. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, even if you're not being sued and brought into court and getting judgments on your student loans, does that have an effect upon the behavior of someone who owes a student loan that's in default? Well, just I'll, before I answer that question, don't forget you can get your income tax refund intercepted if you're in default. Right? Oh, so they don't necessarily have to, they have good collection efforts. Oh, that right? yeah. But you, oh, that's another good point. So there are effects to all of us, even if we don't owe a student loan from the student amount of student loan debt that there is. So there's the problem of debt overhang. You can always say there's there's three places you can put your current money. Right, you can put it into the savings, you can spend it now, or you can pay your past debts. And if you if one of those buckets 
is demanding attention, namely the student debt bucket, I have to pay my past debt, that's less you're spending now, that's less you're saving for the future, that's fewer homes, that's fewer children. Uh, really? Fewer, there, what, there, what, there are, what? There are studies that show that people to, with more student, student loan loans debt. has to do with fertility? No, but you put that people who are able put off the decision to have children because it's not a financially sound decision because they still have a lot of student loan debt. Oh Same goodness. with home ownership. Oh, okay, so in other words, you got an overhang of student loans. You're starting to make it sound like people with a lot of student loans are just not able to be consumers. They can't buy a home, they're not having kids, probably have difficulty getting loans to buy cars. Yeah, well, everything's at the margin, right? I mean, you know, yeah. so you want to say that if you have student loans, you can't buy a home, but yeah. it has the effect of making it, people less able to buy less able to buy a home. Yeah, right. It has the effect of if you're thinking about having children and thinking about the financial side of that. Well, right, the student loan debt is just another factor that goes into that, and that's that maybe that much longer you wait to have children. Yeah. Well, you know, going back to uh, olden times. Not that long ago, what, 15 or so years ago, uh, you could discharge student loans after what was it, seven years? Five, well, it started off five. Five, oh, yeah. That, right. yeah. And then Congress did away with it. And they came up with this FACACTA uh, rules that we have now about you've got to show undue hardship and things of that sort. Is there any hope at all or any effort at the congressional level to try to go some, back to something like the old system? Well, there's the, the Fresh Start Act, uh, which was proposed by Senators Durbin and Cornyn, so it's obviously a bipartisan. Well, well okay, bill. Durbin from Illinois, Illinois my senator. one of the most liberal states on God's earth, and Cornyn from Texas, one of the most conservative. Yes. How could they even agree on the time of day? Well, so Durbin is on record as saying he thinks student loans should be freely dischargeable in bankruptcy. I don't know what Senator Cornyn's position is, but my guess would be that. He probably doesn't think there needs to be any change in existing bankruptcy laws. So you see a true compromise in this bill, which would... So what's the element of compromise in it? So the compromise is that they would be uh, freely dischargeable after 10 years and with undue hardship before that. So 10 years is a long time. That's the total mm -hmm. term of the average student loan. Right? It'd be longer the time period that we used to have to wait was five or seven years. So that's a very long time to wait. But it's, it's better than the current rule because at some point old student loans will become dischargeable and be treated like any other uh, uh, credit card or you know, be treated like a credit card debt. But the, uh, so that's obviously Senator Cornyn given in a little bit, but you know, the 10 year wait, that's Senator Durbin given in a little bit. Uh huh. Right, well, that shows you how compromise can be worked out. I guess we should have to hope that maybe actually Congress would pick it up and enact it. But yeah, let me ask well, you this. Yeah, yeah that's the... <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you this. I've been reading in the newspaper that there's a lot of pressure on the president to simply forgive mm -hmm. some part or all of student loans. Uh, you're a law professor. So I'm told. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. Is it possible that he really has that power to simply eradicate that much debt, or do you think there might be a, uh, a, a statutory constitutional problem? So I think the idea that the president could cancel student loans rests on power in the Higher Education Act uh -huh. about being able to compromise student loans. Uh, so obviously if somebody's, uh, somebody can't pay, the Department of Education has the power to compromise. Uh, the, Argument is that that allows an across-the-board cancellation. Um, there would be a lot of pushback to that, I think. Um, whether there's a, there's more complications here, whether because we were different types of loan programs, some of those are there's no longer giving new loans, and uh, I think no matter what happens, if if the president does cancel some or all of student loan debt, there's going to be there are going to be lawsuits. Uh, then start wrapping your head around that, like what, so there's been a cancellation, but there's a lawsuit, so what happens with the cancellation? Do individuals yeah. pay? I think there's... And then what happens, if, what if it happens if it's set aside? Exactly. Oy. So I don't think whatever, if the president does act, that's not going to be the final act in the play. Well, you know, maybe because it's, shall we say, in the news all the time now with this pressure to do something, you know, God willing, uh, Congress may 
pick up the issue, maybe address the Fresh Start Act and put some bells and whistles on and do anything. Right, and that right. may be the impetus, right? Which yeah. is that the threat of executive action moves Congress yeah. in some more yeah. middle ground way. Well, this you know, was the way it was designed. I mean, the, the, the idea was to promote yeah. compromise. Maybe what will actually happen again. Well, you know, sometimes you gotta say, you gotta do something even if it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Nothing in life can be perfect, I'm afraid, but so maybe they should do something. Well, I gotta tell you, Professor, this has just been a fascinating, if not sometimes frightening discussion about uh, student loans, and we certainly thank you for your analysis. And I hope, I hope, as I said, that our senators and representatives will put some work into this mess because it is a problem that lawyers and judges just cannot solve on their own. For the audience, we thank you for tuning in. In the Industry Viewpoint series in the upcoming days and weeks, we will talk with other experts about the future of industries that are affected by our turbulent economic times. Until then, be well, stay safe, and a good day. Thank <laughs> you.